Hallo und herzlich willkommen zum Ballverliebt Fußball Podcast. Wir haben heute einen Gast bei uns, auf den wir uns jetzt schon seit eineinhalb Monaten sehr gefreut haben. Wir, das bin wie immer ich, der Tom Schaffer und mein lieber Kollege, der Philipp Eitzinger, den ihr gleich hören werdet. Bei uns zu Gast ist Michael Cox, das ist der Autor des englischen Taktikblogs Zonal Marking und auch der Autor des neuen Buchs Zonal Marking, in dem er die Entwicklung der europäischen Fußballwelt von 1992 bis heute beschreibt, von der Ära der Niederländer bis hin zu dem, was er sagt, das jetzt kommt, nämlich die Ära der Engländer. Das ist das Buch, kann ich sehr empfehlen. Wir haben es beide gelesen, der Philipp und ich und es sehr genossen und darum haben wir uns eben gedacht, laden wir den Michael Cox ein, um mit uns über das Buch und ein paar Dinge, die darüber hinausgehen, zu sprechen. Bevor es jetzt losgeht, aber eine Erinnerung. Ballverliebt finanziert sich, wie ihr wisst, rein über euch, über unsere Leser, über unsere Hörer, über Leute, die wollen, dass wir das, was wir hier machen, weitermachen können. Äh, für diesen Podcast haben der Philipp und ich beide ein Buch gelesen, da haben wir viele Stunden dafür investiert. Wir haben uns äh, ausführlich vorbereitet auf das Interview mit Michael, haben das Interview gemacht, haben es geschnitten, haben es herausgebracht. Es ist also immer viel Arbeit, wenn wir auf Ballverliebt etwas veröffentlichen. Damit das weitergeht, brauchen wir circa 500 Euro im Monat. Wir sind derzeit bei unserer Crowdfinanzierung, die läuft über patreon.com slash bei 360 Dollar. Wir haben 86 Leute, die uns unterstützen. Danke, danke dafür. Wir brauchen circa noch 15 Leute, damit wir auf unsere unterste Stufe kommen. Dazu braucht es gar nicht viel, sowas wie ein Bier im Monat zu spendieren. So 5 Euro, das wäre Super und das würde reichen, um damit wir unser Ziel erreichen. Wenn du uns also magst, dann geh jetzt auf patreon.com slash ballverliebt oder auch auf ballverliebt.eu, da findest du auch alles und unterstütze uns. Danke schon dafür. Es kommt wirklich auf jeden einzelnen Unterstützer an. Und jetzt geht's gleich los mit unserer Sendung mit Michael Cox. Wir haben das Gespräch natürlich auf Englisch mit ihm geführt. Wir werden in naher Zukunft auch eine deutsche gekürzte Übersetzung als schriftliches Interview auf ballverliebt.eu Zuerst, wie immer, wenn das möglich ist, für unsere Patreon-Unterstützer als Dank dafür, dass ihr uns helft. Okay, so, um, today we're gonna do it in English, because we have a special guest who happens to be English. Uh, let us welcome to the podcast the wonderful Michael Cox. Hello, Michael. Hello, and thank you very much for inviting me on, and thank you for speaking in English. Uh, like most English people, my language skills are not very good, so I'm very appreciative of the fact that you are uh, doing it in English for me today. Yeah, we're, we're doing our best. <laughs> we're doing our best. Um, the reason you are on is because you just uh, released your second book, which is conveniently called Zonal Marking. I say conveniently because uh, this is what you are famous for. You um, launched the site zonalmarking.net some 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a long time ago now. But yeah, that's, that's the website that I, that I started that focused on tactical analysis of matches. And uh, yeah, it felt like the natural, the natural title for a book like this. I couldn't really have called my book about English football zonal marking because, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we see it very much as a foreign concept. Um, but when it came to writing a book about European football, then, uh, yeah, zonal marking was, uh, was ready to step up and, you know, I have the, the Twitter handle already, so it's been good for publicity. Yeah. Uh, in that book, you lay out the developments in European football for the past 20, 25 to 30 years by dividing it into four year stints of, of dominance, uh, starting by the Netherlands and then Italy, France, Portugal, Spain, Germany. And finally, England. Um, only, by the way, uh, do you know if there's a German version of the book in the pipeline in the near future? Yes, pleased to say that there is. I'm not quite sure when it's going to come out. Hopefully sometime, um, maybe in the next few months. Uh, I'm not quite sure on that. But yeah, I'm very excited that it's coming out in German because, uh, yeah, there's obviously a decent, decent chunk about German football in there. Absolutely. So what we aim to do in today's podcast is to tackle every one of these time frames and connect it to European football as we witness it today. But first, um, let me ask you something completely different. 
you've just been to the Africa Cup of Nations. And admittedly, we didn't see a whole lot of it. Uh, one of the reasons being that the past couple of editions have been quite of poor quality-wise. From a first-hand account, has this one uh, played with 24 teams uh, been any better? Uh, yes and no. I think no, because the, like you say, the 24-team tournament does, I think it just completely distorts the competition. And it also means that you have some teams there who are you know, probably not up to the quality you'd expect to see in a, in a confederational tournament. But I think there has been a big improvement um, in other areas. And I think one of the big factors is the quality of the pitches, which has been a serious problem. With, I think the last two AFCONs, maybe the last three, the pitches in this edition have been in much better condition. And I think we've seen more teams that are willing and able to play passing football on those kind of surfaces. The one caveat is... Obviously, it's the first time that the, the tournament's been held in the summer. It always used to be in February, whereas it's now been in June. And in Egypt, it was incredibly hot. I mean, the temperature varied, but particularly the games in Cairo. Um, and again, the 24-team tournament meant that there had to be three games a day at some point. So one of them was kicking off at, I think, four o'clock or five o'clock in the afternoon. And it's just so difficult to play good football or any kind of football, really, in that kind of heat. So... Yeah, I think once once they whittled the 24 teams down to 16, um, it was pretty good from the second round onwards. And there's been some good stories. Madagascar in particular getting to the quarterfinal stage. Um, they were, you know, real underdogs the first time they'd qualified. And they didn't just park the bus and counterattack. They played really good passing football. Um, so there's been some positive stories. I'm not sure whether the final will be good because often the final of, of AFCONs, or the final of most major tournaments are usually quite... Uh, quite cagey but uh i think it's definitely one to uh to uh to look out for um it's algeria against senegal um and it's going to be played on friday um and with that i would say we come back to europe and to a country where 40 degrees celsius are not that often encountered the at Netherlands. Least, at least not for the next 20 years. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're starting with the Netherlands, with the Dutch area uh, era. Um, if you look at football today, let me just ask you bluntly, who won? Johan Cruyff or Louis van Gaal? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I mean, I tend towards saying van Gaal. I mean, the, the first chapter of this book is basically about the difference between those two managers who preach very similar styles in terms of the formation, in terms of passing football, but basically have completely different ideas about how to treat star players. So Van Gaal doesn't want any stars and it's all about the collective process and Cruyff loves superstars and kind of overloads on Barcelona with them. Um, I mean, the, the complication here is that I think many of Van Gaal's ideas came from Cruyff originally in terms of the overall shape of the team. But I do think that, you know, when you look at the best teams in Europe now and the way that they're so structured in the way that they attack i think that's very much more a van Gaal uh philosophy than a Cruyff philosophy um ajax excited everyone this season by eliminating real madrid and juventus and nearly making it to the champions league final what would you say how much Cruyff and how much van Gaal was in that particular team yeah the, i mean i think a little bit of both i think that there was um I mean, maybe the most interesting thing about this Ajax team is the way that they kind of overloaded the flanks so the wingers would cross from one flank to the other and, and kind of play combinations with the guy on the opposite side. And that's very, very much what Van Gaal didn't want. He insisted his wingers would stay very high and very wide and would try and get the opposition in, in one, uh, one against one situations down the flanks. So I guess, the, I guess it was a kind of updated version of... of what Van Gaal wanted in that respect, um, you know, modifying the way that they use the wingers. And of course, there's still a big Cruyff influence. But, you know, to go back to the kind of individual and collective debate, I'm not sure this Ajax team was really about individuals. Obviously, there's been some some fantastic players that have come through. And, and of course, they're moving to the bigger sides in Europe now. But I think it really was a collective effort, particularly in the attacking phase of play. So again, I'd, I'd be more inclined to say it's a little bit more Van Gaal than Cruyff. Um, when I read that part in your book about um, um, Cruyff's Barcelona side in the early 90s and your characterization of him as well, and later on what you wrote about Real Madrid as, at Real Madrid as a club, um, where the players are not only Galacticos, but also hold most of the power compared to the coach, 
I, I noticed a thought creeping up on me, <laughs> and, uh, and it might be a bit heretic. But with all his clarification of the superior in individuals of the co over the collective and his practice of giving players power and embracing arguments in the dressing room, Kreuz, Kreuz could have been a good fit at Real Madrid. <laughs> uh, is that too heretical or did you ever have that thought as well? That's a good point. I must admit, I hadn't, I hadn't considered that. You just kind of think of Cruyff as so ingrained at Barcelona. You, you can't always, almost can't imagine it. But yeah, like you say, he loved the individuals and that's always been Real Madrid more than Barcelona. Like you say, Real Madrid has always been about the players and the president and the managers, almost this kind of disposable middleman. Um, whereas at Barcelona, you think of the year is probably more in terms of the managers and the players sometimes. So yeah, you're right. I think, uh, I think Cruyff would would probably have loved the the superstar obsession at Real Madrid, and of course, one of the superstars he fell out with was Michael Laudrup, who then went to Real Madrid and and sure. was hugely popular there and played a, a part in that famous five 0 victory over Barcelona. So, yeah, that's certainly more of a superstar culture than Barcelona. But in the early nineties, when when he was coach at Barcelona, they had that kind of as well. Um, um, you you're describing the antics of the star players in this in this this in this area a little bit in your uh, book, and uh, it was the part where I laughed um, the most, I guess. Um, just like Romario not showing up after the 1994 World Cup because he was partying in in Rio instead. Uh, that's very unlikely to be a history you would write about a modern day top class team, isn't it? Yeah, sadly, I think you're right, and. Uh... Yeah, it was it was a lot more it was a lot easier to find kind of funny stories from the 1990s when players were a lot less professional than they are now and I found that as well probably more so with my first book which was just about the Premier League because the Premier League was about drinking and eating in the 1990s whereas obviously the players are super fit these days so yeah I guess there's a, a slight shift in the book it starts with with some more funny stories and then later on the players are, are too professional and, and the tactics are much more complex. So, yeah, I, I guess the book gets a little bit more uh, in-depth as it goes on. You took 1992 as a starting point, um, also because that was the time when the back pass rule was, was introduced. Um, this is a very hypothetical question, but... Um, how much do you think the history of, of football as a whole would have differed from the one we, we witnessed had the back pass rule not been introduced? Yeah, it's a good question and a difficult one to answer because I think the back pass rule had so many knock-on effects. I mean, obviously the goalkeepers had to play out from the back. The defenders had to be more technical. I think the speed of the game obviously increased a lot. There were fewer breaks in play. And I think teams were encouraged to press higher up to force mistakes. So those are four pretty major changes over the last 27 years. Um, it's difficult really to know what the catalyst would have been if it wasn't for the back pass change in terms of things becoming a little bit more technical. I suspect the Bosman ruling probably still would have had a big impact in terms of you know players moving uh, across boundaries. And we certainly saw that in England when we were you know, blessed with, with lots of Dutch players and lots of French and Spanish players coming, our league became more technical. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just think it was such a huge, almost overnight change to football, uh, the back pass ruling. And, you know, it's, it's difficult to imagine it without it, really. It's comparable to the offside law, I guess. With the... Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think, you know, tactics is always about adjusting to the to the rules of the game. And, and you you can look at the offside law and the back pass law and to a certain extent, changes to how you can tackle uh, opponents. Uh, all those things have, have really helped football become more technical over the last 25 years or so. I take a little step for, forward now to, to England because um, you said that Sonal Koeman kind of represented the Dutch in the Premier League and for various reasons it didn't really work out at Everton. Um, to which my question would be, can you see Eric Ten Hag go to the Premier League and have an impact there? And maybe what would the team or the club that would be the best fit for him? Yeah, I don't see any reason why not. I think he, you know, from what I've seen at Ajax, he seems like a really good manager, works a lot on positional play and 
obviously his team plays a very possession based game. Um, and of course, Kuman, I think, did a really good job at Southampton. You know, he took over from Pochettino, mm. who received a lot of praise for his work at Southampton, and rightly so. But they actually improved in terms of positioning under under Kuman. They finished higher up the league. They finished in sixth place. So, yeah, I think I think he, he maybe didn't do so well at Everton, but he still did a good job. In terms of Ten Hag, I mean, I, I think Arsenal really is is probably of the major clubs the one that would suit him best. They're a club that you know, tries to play, you know, traditionally tries to play possession football. They're also a club who don't have the money to spend on lots of expensive players. So maybe need someone who can bring through youth players. Um, obviously, they've got Unai Emery there at the moment. He's he's obviously going to be there for the upcoming season, but I wouldn't necessarily bank on him being there in, say, two years' time. So, yeah, it would be cool if Ten Hag comes over. He's obviously a very bright coach and... Uh, yeah, we always get very excited about Dutch managers in England whenever they come over. So, yeah, maybe that will happen in the future. I honestly cannot imagine him not going to the Premier League sooner or later. Um, and with that, Tom, I would say we go to the next country. Yes, which let's would switch be to Italy. Italy. Where all the Dutch players went uh, in this area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with with. Kulit and Raikard at, at, at the famous Arrigo Saki team from AC Milan. But if you look at what made the Serie A team so dominant in the 1990s, um, and in your book you mentioned different system, versatile players, competent defending, and the use of different strikers for different tasks. Um, what is today's Serie A le lacking to go back to where it once was, other than the money to buy two star players, of course, but tactically spe speaking? Well, I'd say there's probably three issues. One is the money, like you say, and, and there's, there's wider problems with Italian football in terms of the stadiums and stuff that feeds into that. Two, I think back then Italian football had almost... Uh, almost had a monopoly on that kind of coaching education. You know, the, the school at Covacciano in, in Florence was massively ahead of its time in terms of being a, a kind of university of footballing education. And I think now across the continent, there's just more of an emphasis upon studying to be a coach. So I think they've kind of lost the advantage there. And in terms of when I actually watch the games and see what's lacking, I just think Italian football is considerably slower than the other major leagues. And I think that sometimes is evident when they, you know, when Italian teams face English or German or Spanish sides in European competition, they just don't look well equipped to deal with the intensity. It's tough to know why that is, whether it's because of the weather, you know, the climate there is warmer than some of the other countries, whether it's the stadiums being half empty and there's not much atmosphere, whether it's just a, you know, a, a hangover from, from previous decades of the way Italian football traditionally played. but. I just always think that speed is, is kind of lacking from Italian football. So, yeah, there's various issues. There's various issues. I'm, I'm a big fan of Serie A. I was always a big fan growing up. But I must say, the last three or four years, um, it's, it's been a little bit difficult to get into um, from you know, a combination of the lack of quality compared to some of the other major leagues, but also the lack of competitiveness. I mean, Serie A in the 90s wasn't just the best league in the world in terms of The quality, there were often seven teams who started the started the season being able to win the league, and often that's been down to one or two. So there's there's various issues there for Italian football, I think. And also mostly one. Money. <laughs> no, bo mostly one team oh, yeah. being Juventus. Yeah, and, and what you can't forget, and what you also mentioned in your book, is in the 90s, Uh, the money was in Italy, but there was a lot of billionaires and millionaires buying clubs, and that's why all the stars from the Dutch league or something somewhere else uh, went there. Um, yeah, you you mentioned Covecciano um, as the famous school for educating top class coaches, and there's no doubt that Italy has a huge amount of really in interesting. Oh, just it had in the 1990s, and it, I think it still has today. But why, other than maybe say Ranieri at Leicester and Ancelotti wherever he goes, do they never seem to la last long outside of Italy? Yeah, um, it's a fair question. I mean, I think that uh, 
Uh, well, first of all, I think there's a uh, just a general culture of short termism in Italian football, um, which you see with the clubs changing managers sometimes three or four times in in a season, and and therefore the managers I, I don't think are conditioned to really build for the long term. They're not really conditioned to bring through youth products because they know they won't be around to see the benefits. And I guess that kind of rubs off elsewhere. Um, you know, you look at someone like Conte at Chelsea, who completely revolutionised the Premier League with his three at the back. And almost every team was copying him within half a season. Um, but he showed no real inclination to bring through young players. And they kind of ran out of run out of steam and he, he left after uh, his second season, of course. So, yeah, the, I, I, that's one issue, the short-termism. And I think the other factor is, you know, Italian football, less than the other major nations, I mean, there's no real emphasis there on playing good football in Italy. And sometimes you get managers like, you know, Capello's had two stints at Real Madrid. He's won the league twice and he's been sacked twice because they didn't like his style of football. So it's always a little bit of a culture shock, I think, for Italian coaches when they go abroad. And, you know, basically the fans don't like the, the style of football and, and therefore they often don't last long. Um, you just said it also in the 1990s. Not every team from Serie A played particularly entertaining football. Um, you did watch a whole lot of Serie A also in research for your, for your book, I imagine. What is the team that you enjoyed watching most and what team did you enjoy watching the least from back then? <laughs> Oh, um, the team I enjoyed watching the most was probably Udinese when they were managed by Zaccaroni, which was a really I knew interesting you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that probably comes across in the book. Yes, a little um, bit. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so they, they played 3-4-3 three, three and kind of played three outright forwards when that was pretty rare in Italian football. And, and Zaccaroni then went to Milan and took that philosophy and took two players, Biroff and Helweg, um, and kind of made Milan into his, you know, his old Udinese side with a little bit more flair with the likes of Boban. Um, the team I enjoyed watching least, <sighs> there were a couple of the, I mean, Inter had so many great forwards at certain points, but they often played this team that was just completely disconnected. So you've got two really good strikers waiting up front for service and just no one to connect the midfield and attack. And I think that was a real problem in Italian football at the time. You know, the Trecortista had fallen out of favour and until it's returned to prominence with the likes of Francesco Totti, sometimes you were, you know, there was teams who were playing really quite ugly football. So, yeah, I don't think Inter were the worst to watch, but I think they're probably the most frustrating considering the level of talent they had on show. I remember a game I stumbled upon recently was from 1998 in the Champions League game interplayed at Sturm Graz in Austria. Uh, and they played their, their, their uh, uh, 3 5 2 and, and with, with two st strikers front. I can't really remember who it was. I think it was Rin uh, Ronaldo and somebody else. But you would never have guessed who the most advanced midfield play player was for Inter at that game. Diego Simeone. <laughs> ah, yeah. Interesting. Well, yeah, that is, I mean, that sums it up, doesn't it? But the, I remember Simeone had one season where he scored loads of goals and it was actually the same when uh, Paul Lintz went over there, which, you know, was a really big thing in England because we weren't used to, but apart from Gascoigne, we weren't really used to players going abroad. And, and Ince scored, I think, like eight goals in a, a Serie A season, which he never came close to in the Premier League. So, yeah, Italians had... Um, At that point, even you know, even your most attacking midfielder was essentially a defensive midfielder, which is quite you know quite telling. <laughs> <laughs> um, and with that, I would say this is a neat transition to 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 France with 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 a holding midfielder. And um, after the 2018 World Cup, I wrote in my tournament his uh, summary that Didier Deschamps doesn't feel responsible for delivering a show. He was one of the world's best holding midfielders and kept th thinking like one until today. Zidane Zidane, on the other hand, his partner in the, in the France team that won the tournament in 1998 and 2000, 
and now led Real Madrid to three consecutive Champions League titles, was the complete opposite. He helped by showing flashes of brilliance while not taking a special interest in the team's general structure. Does that contrast summarize what the French team between 1998 and 2006 combined so expertly? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, I mean, I quite enjoyed what, uh, researching Deschamps in this book because obviously he was the water carrier and he kind of came to define that role. But I, I think he was actually also a really good player on the ball and um, that maybe got forgotten because he was so happy to just sit there and support Zidane, both for Juventus and for France. But it was nice to come across some quotes from players who played alongside him who said, you know, OK, he's the water carrier and he's happy doing that. But he was very good at, you know, receiving the ball in tight spaces and he could kind of just almost drift past players with his first touch. Um, a little bit like Tony Crowes does today, not that Deschamps was quite in that class, but the way of receiving the ball and just easing past opponents. So, yeah, I mean, Deschamps probably doesn't get enough credit for what he's done in football, you know, to captain the the World Cup winners and the European Championship winners, and then to manage them as well. Um, it's a pretty incredible achievement, really. And uh, yeah, of course, he kind of set the tone for the the, the France, uh, the French water carrier that the likes of Makaleli and, and N'Golo Kante in recent years have come to define as well. But on the other hand, that, that number 10 role that also plays a key part in, in French football history not least with, with, with Michel Platini in the 80s and, and of course with, with Zidane. Could it be the case that maybe France spent too much time looking for the next Zidane and, and until ultimately fi finding, okay, there just is no real n n number 10 and also football itself has moved on that now only in recent years they kind of got back on track? Yeah, maybe. I think there's been a few players who've probably been overhyped or too much emphasis put on their play for France since Zidane retired. Um, you know, I remember so much hype about uh, Yohan Gourcouf, who of course briefly looked fantastic, but never really did at the top level. Ribéry was always a better player out wide, but I remember him being cast as the new Zidane. Sami Nasri, a little bit of a false starter. So yeah, I mean, you know, you can only really base your team around a number 10 if there's a number 10 worth basing a team around, which is an obvious point. But, you know, I think France have, have obviously been better in the you know last three years or so when they've, they've kind of just worked with what they had. And, and Griezmann's been the second striker rather than anyone playing as a number 10. So, yeah, they, they do have this obsession with the number 10 role France. Um, and that was the case just as Zidane was coming around as well because they were obsessed with finding the Platini. So, um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting football and culture. Maybe not the most prominent in Europe compared to Spain or Germany or Italy or England, but uh, yeah, I enjoyed researching. Mm. Um, um, what I read in the book, you also enjoyed watching Yuri Jorkaev. Is that right? <laughs> hey. Yeah, yeah, he, he was a great player and, you know, scored some really important goals for France. There was a goal in... Euro 96 qualifiers that basically saved the job, uh, saved the job of Jacquet. And I, I mean, I personally don't think he was too much inferior to Zidane. I think he was wonderfully gifted, fantastic at controlling the ball, could play good passes and, and got into the box and scored lots of goals. He was more of a forward than Zidane. I think more of a forward than a midfielder, um, but probably closer in style to, to Platini, who was the player who, you know, the French public were desperate for Zidane to to be. Zidane, I think, obviously achieved more than Djorkaev. Um, but he was a different kind of player. He was very much a midfield controller, whereas I think Djorkaev, at his best, could kind of dominate midfield and push forward and contribute into the in the final third as well, which for me is the kind of definition of a number 10. I, I thought it was really interesting in your book to, to read about Zidane. Uh, Again, because yeah, you've forgot most of his career by now. Uh, you just remember the highlights. Uh, and uh, when when, you read, when I read your book, I, I was it was kind of curious to read that most of the time he wasn't particularly good, was he? <laughs> or consistent? Yeah, not not at his best. Let's say like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that's the most kind of common feedback I've had about the book. Um, 
about Zidane, who, yeah, of course, was a wonderful player and generally fantastic at tournaments, often provided major moments in big games, obviously the volley in the Champions League final. But when you actually look at his career season by season, certainly when he was in Italy and Spain for a combined 10 years, he probably only had two really great seasons. And the rest was sometimes struggling for fitness, sometimes struggling for form, very often was basically not contributing in terms of assists or goals. There was a period at Juventus where he was completely out of sorts for about 18 months. Um, and at Real Madrid, I, I kind of have more sympathy for him at Real Madrid because, you know, they, they were in their Galacticos area where they were selling Makaleli and basically forgetting about the structure of the team. And I think that affected Zidane's game. But yeah, over the course of a season, um, I think he was often quite inconsistent, to be honest. Um, and so I think he's probably the only player that I focus on heavily in the book who, who doesn't come out of it particularly well, to be honest. Yeah, true. And he also had to uh, to reinvent his game often. First, when he came to Juventus, where he more or less got infused with a winner mentality. And later on, he had to reinvent it as an entertainer for Real Madrid as well. Uh, a very, very interesting uh, chapter um i can just recommend it to anyone to read the book uh but there's another question about french that i'd like to ask and it's about the youth system clairefontaine um which is said to be on the, the side of physical strength and people say that people like antoine Griezmann wouldn't have made it if they hadn't gone uh, to real sociedad very early in his career um do you think that's true yeah possibly i i that's a tough question I think that it was probably right for the time, Claire Fontaine, and it produced a lot of really good players who, more than anything else, were extremely quick. I think that's the sense you get when going from 90s Serie A to looking at the French national team, the likes of Anelka and Omri are just on a different level in terms of their physical brilliance. Um, but yeah, football's become more technical and it's moved away from from that model and it's also moved away from really the Claire Fontaine model and, and moved towards the German system of, of having more regional academies. Um, so yeah, it was like a lot of things in, in this book, it was, it was kind of revolutionary at the time. And then people moved away from it, both in terms of style of football and in terms of structure of the academy, but also, you know, at the time it had a huge impact on, on football and you see all the other countries kind of trying to replicate Claire Fontaine and, and create their own version, but no one ever really, you know, got to a you know, got to a level that dominated a team as much as Claire Fontaine dominated the French national team. Yeah, um the the French era of dominance is interesting because it wasn't really backed up by the own league of this uh of the nation. Uh and the same maybe is true for Portugal. So um the, the next era we're talking about. Uh, it's um, those eras are more dominated by coaching philosophy and the most important coach in Portugal, um, at least in the past 15 years, I'd say is, is Jose Mourinho, 20 years maybe. Um, today, he seems like to be a fading coach. Um, why do you think that is? And do you think he, he will recover? Yeah, I, I think it's probably true that he's fading. Um, again, he's one of those coaches who comes in with with basically a different way of working about things, um, which I would say would probably, probably threefold. One is he puts such a big emphasis on scouting the opposition at a time when a lot of managers in Europe were not really doing that in anywhere near as much depth. And I think he was just very good tactically, tactically because of that. Two, I think he was um, a great man manager. And I think there's probably been a slight shift in the way you have to treat players over the past 15 years. I think there's more players who expect some kind of superstar treatment, which Mourinho isn't generally willing to give them. And three, and maybe most pertinent with regard to Portugal, is he had this kind of semi-revolutionary uh, way of training, um, this so-called tactical periodization model, which again at the time was quite revolutionary, um, which basically involved not separating physical and tactical and technical training sessions and combining everything, um, which was pretty rare at the time, but most top coaches now incorporate it in one form or another. So I think really a lot of managers have just caught up with Mourinho's philosophy and, and overtaken it now. So 
whether he can get back to you know get back to the his old self i don't know really because i think a lot of it is just about his his personality clashes with players i, I still think he's a very competent tactician um but he seems he just seems to fall out with people and uh yeah, it wasn't a great surprise that his period at Manchester United only lasted what two and a half seasons because that's been basically the pattern of his recent career. So basically, Mourinho was ahead of his time for like seven years, ten years, and now that everyone else doing what he was doing, and he's finding it hard to to get um some something like a unique selling point again, a new edge. Yeah. <laughs> The curse of the innovator, more or less. Yeah, you 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 invent something really n new, uh, then everybody is trying to copy you, and you have to find something different uh, to get ahead again. And that's not always easy to do. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, and you see it with various coaches. I mean, in in the first book about the Premier League, it was certainly the case with Arsene Wenger, who came in and you know revolutionized England English football in terms of professionalism and diet and physiology. And to a certain extent, tactically as well. But 10 years later, basically everyone's caught up. And then five years later, everyone is kind of ahead of or all the other major coaches are ahead of Wenger. So yeah, you see it quite a lot in football. Someone has a big impact by doing one thing differently, but then mm. uh, get left behind. Mm, Arsene Wenger was, was ridiculed at the beginning. Uh, and then everyone saw, well, well, maybe his ideas aren't so bad after all. Coming back to Portugal, a um, big part of the Portuguese chapter is about wingers and, and Portugal always pr producing magnificent wingers but lacking a poacher. And in the tradition of great wingers like Figo and Simao and Guarejma and the young, the young Cristiano Ronaldo also, now João Felix joins Atletico and it, he seems to be prolific both as a winger And there's a forward in the 4-4-2, and there's a number 10 or playmaker, second, second, strike, set, second striker hybrid. Could it be that Ronaldo's change from wing to center in his later years now gets used as a template for the footballing education Portugal as a whole to produce that kind of versatility from a very young age? And maybe João Felix is the first one we really get to see with the new system maybe yeah that's a great point i hadn't really considered that but yeah you're right he's he looks completely different from the classic portuguese winger he's someone who can play wherever he seems to have the physicality um or at least will have the physicality in future to play centrally maybe as a forward maybe as a second striker so yeah things have moved on um you know the the ronaldo generation and by that i mean him and quaresma and Simao, nanny to a certain extent all kind of grew up wanting to be Luis Figo, who was a great player, but very much a winger. Whereas, like you say, Ronaldo is now something more than that. I think he's pioneered this ultra all-round versatile forward. And obviously everyone in Portugal wants to be Ronaldo now. So yeah, João Felix is probably the next iteration of the Portuguese forward and a very different player to, to Figo. I, when, when I read your book, And, and, and you said that kind of Figo took the young Ronaldo under his wings a bit. Um, to me, watching, watching Portugal, the, the Nations League finals now, kind of seemed like Ronaldo was doing the same thing now for Joao Felix. Could, could that be true? Yeah, I think so. I think Ronaldo sometimes is seen as a, a kind of individualistic character, but I think what is clear is he really does care about Portugal and Portuguese football. And, you know, he, he sees that this guy is going to be around long after he's gone. So he seemed to be seemed to be supportive. And obviously it was a big, big thing for João Felix making his international debut on home soil in, uh, in a kind of important game in the Nations League semi-final. So, yeah, I think, I think Ronaldo will probably be quite good with him. And by all accounts, he's a pretty good captain for Portugal. Something that's quite funny as well. You define the Portuguese era between tw 2002 and 2006, when, except from from um, Porto winning the Champions League, they didn't really win anything on the national level or anything else, uh, really. Um, 
quite opposite to the last three years where they won the European Championship and now the, even the Nations League. Um, was it hard to define this era where there are no better nations around at this time and that's why you picked Portugal? Well, I mean, I, mean, I should correct you slightly. It's 2004 to 2008. But yeah, like Sorry, you say, yeah. there's... there's um, There's no outright national success in terms of the, the national team, but they were the only country to get to the knockout stage of Euro 2004, World Cup 2006, and Euro 2008. Um, and you also have the rise of Ronaldo, the rise of Mourinho. They hosted Euro 2004. And you have George Mendes, who's, you know, goes from nowhere to, to kind of pioneer the way that um, transfer deals are done and has a major impact on on Portugal being so good at importing South American talent, which I think then has a knock-on effect to, to how the, the sport is played. So there's a lot going on with Portugal in, in a kind of short period of time. And uh, yeah, it, it wasn't outright success at a national team level, but to be perfectly honest, I think Portugal were a far better team in 2006, for example, than they were at Euro 2016, when I think they got kind of lucky and, yeah. and drew their way through the group. Um, a you know, horrible tournament that, as well. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the best. It wasn't the best, was it? Again, 24 team tournaments, I don't think really work out very well. So, yeah, they didn't quite have the outright success. But, you know, I think at a couple of those tournaments, they're probably a little bit unlucky not to not to go on and win the thing. Uh, the next question I have to um, warn you. Um, Tom is kind of an avid Liverpool supporter, and this is the kind of question only a Liverpool supporter may probably ask in oh, come that on. particular manner. <laughs> It's got nothing to do with it. Um, no. <laughs> no, but uh, we talked about Mourinho and maybe he's uh, fading. Uh, and of course, now we are switching from Portugal to Spain, as does your book uh, in 2008. Um, and it's a great pivot for our discussion. Mourinho is failing. When will Guardiola finally do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I think the big difference is Guardiola is constantly trying to change and update his methods, maybe more so than he needs to at times, because, you know, he's, he's, never, he's never encountered any significant failures, I would say. Um, And sometimes is accused of kind of overthinking and over meddling in his tactical plans. But I think you can see a very different iteration of, of Guardiola after he goes to Germany and to a certain extent after he goes to the Premier League. He hasn't just tried to play exactly Barcelona football everywhere. I think he's, he's developed, he's learned, he adjusts according to the country he's in. And I think that's really why he's been so successful. Mm -hmm. So... No good news for Liverpool fans and anyone else in Premier League. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, Guardiola and the Spanish era, the, the Spanish era in your book, they more or less coincide with the return of Dutch style ideas uh, to the very top of football, at least. And you could more or less summarize the approach of Guardiola by, by uh, constructing a new word like total midfield. Uh, so everyone on the pitch should be a midfielder. Do you think that's the only logical conclusion to the, the, the development that started with Rinos Michels? Yeah, possibly. I mean, in terms of, you know, that Dutch style wanted center forwards that could link play and they wanted defenders who could play out from the back and play a very high line. So almost all the players was compressed into midfield. So yeah, it was it was a kind of continuation of that or a reinvention of that. And you have this quite nice story where Four players, Busquets, Xavi, Iniesta and Fabregas all came through the Barcelona system wanting to be Guardiola and then obviously reappear for his Barcelona side and take the Spanish national team to great heights. So yeah, the, the repopularization of the midfield or the passing midfielder in particular was, was definitely the key theme of, um, of Spanish football and indeed European football during this period. Um, in your book, you also talk about the Argentine influence into the Spanish football uh, and about two players very specifically and that's of course Lionel and Messi and uh, but also but also Alfredo Di Stefano the, the Real Madrid player in the what was it the 50s I guess 50s yeah and you explain that their interpretations of the roles that they played redefined the tactics of their teams and later also the countries concerned um, 
while like for example the Stefano questioning the strict separations of roles like not, there's the, there's not only a, an attacker and a defender and they have nothing to do with each other but he would switch between roles um, on the pitch uh, and Messi of course basically forcing the invention of the of the role of the false nine uh, do you think innovation in football is ultimately more driven by players or by coaches I think oh that's a difficult question I think it's somewhere near to 50-50, which is a boring answer, but I think a lot of people think it's just about the coaching styles and people think the tactics is just about the coaches. But no, there's there's a lot of players, often when it's players that go from one country to another and they bring across a style. So yeah, Messi's a good example of that. He comes to La Masia and wants to play Argentine style. He wants to play like Maradona. He wants to dribble and he wants to play basically as a number 10, which Barcelona don't have room for in their system in their kind of 4-3-3. So you do see kind of converging of the styles. Messi becomes a little bit more Barcelona. Barcelona become a little bit more Messi, a little bit more Argentine, and they have to find room for this, you know, incredible number 10 or a player who wants to play as number 10 and eventually does get his, his wish, albeit as a kind of false nine rather than what you would consider a conventional number 10. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think it's 50-50. I think, I think probably... Probably it's now shifted again to coaches more than players because you have less shocks when a player moves from one country to another because there's a little bit more homogenization. So I think there's probably less room for players to be complete revolutionaries like Cantona was in England in the 1990s or, um, you know, to a certain extent, Ronaldo was for Manchester United um, and, and Messi, like you mentioned. Um but yeah, it's, you know, certainly in this book, it's been a big factor in terms of advancing the style in various countries, you know, just the introduction of new players with new ideas. Um, okay, that's a, a little bit of a pivot in the, in the line of questioning. But when you talk about the Spanish era, you also have, of course, to talk about Barcelona. Uh, and you wrote in the book that three pairs co- coined to Barcelona over the past decades. The first one was Rinus Michels with, with Johan Cruyff. Then it was Cruyff with Guardiola. And then it was Guardiola with Xavi. <laughs> um, looking a little bit in the future, uh, Xavi just signed his first contract as a coach, although it is in al Sadd in Qatar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> will he be the coach in another one of those pairings for Barcelona in 10 years' time? Yeah, that seems the natural conclusion or the natural next step. Um, he clearly believes in the Barcelona philosophy probably more than anyone else in the last 20 or so years, probably since Guardiola. He is clearly a very intelligent and studious guy. Um, He has shown, you know, a desire to become a coach, um, obviously by what he's doing in Qatar. Um, So, yeah, I I think that is almost inevitable. But I do slightly wonder what his path to it will be. You think he probably can't go straight from coaching in Qatar to coaching in Barcelona. (laughs) Maybe he wouldn't want to drop down to the B team. Um, so maybe some other team in, in Spain and then move on to Barca. But yeah, I think that that seems very, very likely and, and probably has done since, you know, for, for about 10 years, really, since, since Xavi became, you know, so revered. He just seemed like the player who was going to become a coach along with, um, you know, Xavi Alonso, who of course wasn't at Barcelona, but again, a really studious guy who is taking his first coaching steps with Real Sociedad you know those two were at one point kind of epitomized the Barcelona Real Madrid rivalry and I think maybe we could see them one day coaching those teams in a Clásico mm-hmm. and Xabi Alonso and Pep Guardiola interestingly worked together in Germany at Bayern Munich and but when when they arrived in Germany the German football was um, already um reaching heights that they haven't had reached in the past 10, 15, 20 years. And one of the core elements, and moving on to Germany, with that one of the core elements you describe in the resurgence of the German football was the reinvention of itself and of certain positions too, like the one of Müller as the Raumdeuter, as he is described himself, and also the sweeper keeper stuff done by Manuel Neuer. Um, one of our readers recently remarked to us that I quote Neuer could have been an all time great goalkeeper until he tried to reinvent his position. Hmm. How would you react to that quote? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I hadn't really considered that before. Obviously, his his performances over the last three or four years haven't been particularly impressive. Um, it's tough to say. I mean, I think he was a very good goalkeeper in the traditional sense, even when he was trying to be a sweeper keeper. So I'm not necessarily sure that I agree with that view because I think that there's... Yeah, he he was a very good goalkeeper in a traditional sense anyway. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that his emphasis on being a sweeper keeper is what has led to his decline as a shot stopper. Um, but yeah, it's an, an interesting argument. Maybe I'd need to... I'd, I'd happily read an article to be convinced by that argument before I sign up to uh, agreeing with it. But uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting take. Yeah, Marty does, if you're listening, you have to write an article in English now. <laughs> <laughs> I would argue it's more to do with age and injury, but that's for another discussion. And um, in his three years in Germany, Guardiola really came to hate the German media, who were obsessed with every tiny gossip story, but didn't really care for his tactics at all, other than bemoaning that it was his influence that came to prompt Löw to face out the old-school German poacher and his reluctance to play physical football. Could it be that a tactical development like Jurgen Klopp's gegenpressing that is so reliant on physical strength and stamina is the only one possible coming from a country with the footballing history of Germany? Though that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. I think it's a combination of um, kind of a rethinking of the concepts of football in a very studious manner also combined with that emphasis on physicality and, and hard work, which is maybe more, diff uh, more easy to do in, in countries with a slightly lower climate, at least in the, in the football season. You know, I don't think that style of football would be possible so much in Seville, for example. Um, mm. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting point and, and probably is a little bit true, but it was certainly, um, I think it was certainly suited to, to Dortmund, you know, which is a club who, who they want to see kind of working football and fighting football, as Klopp always says, maybe had that, you know, had Klopp been a kind of coming through the ranks at Bayern, which in itself is probably unlikely, he maybe would have struggled to impose that so strictly. But of course, once Dortmund, you know, won two titles with that system, then it kind of got picked up by, by Bayern and they, uh, they kind of replicated that approach. So, Yeah, I guess it's a very German style of football. Mm. But as you write um, in the book, it is something that he saw Barcelona doing, um, at least in yeah some core elements of it, like Barcelona um, attacking whenever they lost the ball. That's the inspiration where Klopp got it from. Yeah, it's interesting. He kind of took it from Barcelona while also not being a big fan of Barcelona's style. Yes, And I guess they kind of, they did it for different reasons. Barcelona kind of won the ball quickly because They weren't a good defensive side. They didn't like defending deep. Um, so they just wanted to have the ball. Whereas but, whereas uh, Dortmund were, you know, I think quite solid defensively and very good at counter-attacking from deep. But Klopp just saw it as, you know, a key moment to start attacks. So I think there was a kind of, yeah, a different approach. Well, a similar approach, but probably for different reasons. And that's, that's one part where I think uh, I really love the book because... Uh, it's so concisely explained how all those innovations came together, like the c transitional play of the Portuguese league, when the, what what Mourinho did, and then uh, the Spanish innovation that that uh, Guardiola did and that the Kitaka had, and then Klopp taking it, using it in a German, very German setting, and making something new out of it. Um, that was a very very enlightening part of the book, I guess. Yeah. Um If you think back of, of of the Guardiola years at Bayern, when when we really not only shifted around his formations from one game to another, but from one minute to another, often three or four times, just within a half, um, and really being at the forefront of tactical innovation in the whole of Europe. And uh, now jumping forward to, to the Bayern team we saw this year, especially also against, against Liverpool in the Champions League, that looked very ordinary and having nothing particularly special about it. Um, do you think it's, it's only just the departure of Klopp and Guardiola that 
that prompted the decline in German football of recent years, on also of German club football? Yeah, I think that's probably the main factor. I think there was also clearly, uh, you know, there's still some good players coming through, but I think there was a very obvious, almost golden generation of really good young players that came through in, I guess, 2010, 2011, 2012. Maybe some of them have, have faded, uh, and some, of course, have moved abroad as well. Um, and once again, I guess, people catching up with, with the emphasis upon pressing. Um, I mean, certainly from an English perspective, probably until Pochettino came over in 2013, I think, there wasn't that much emphasis on pressing at all. So, you know, the German, the German club teams were just doing things the English sides weren't even trying to. So they've kind of maybe lost that competitive advantage. Um, but it's clear that there's some, you know, some very bright young coaches in the Bundesliga and sometimes it just takes a few years of kind of regeneration and, and reinventing uh you know the individual club sides and you know i'm sure that there'll be a, a force in in years to come um Jürgen Klopp has, more, has molded his gegen pressing style with a more possession based approach at liverpool um dortmund had an exp had an expiry date um of of three or four years do you think that he sooner or later faces the same problem at liverpool Uh, it's tough to say. I mean, his track record suggests that maybe the team will tie a little bit. But you tend to think that Klopp's probably learned his lessons from before. Um, and I think at Dortmund, that final season at Dortmund was very strange. The, the results really didn't match the the performances quite a lot of the time. So I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't read too much into that for now. If there's some signs of it in the next two or three seasons, maybe we can say yes. But, you know, I think Liverpool have, They've probably got the capacity to have a bigger squad than uh, than Dortmund as well. Maybe we haven't yet seen that. I think there's still quite an obvious starting eleven and a bit of a drop off to you know the backup certainly in the front three. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, I, I, you know Klopp's clearly a, a studious guy, an intelligent guy, and if he thinks he made any mistakes with Dortmund in those last couple of seasons, I'm sure he'll he'll correct him for for his time at Liverpool. Um, and that's where we get to England, the, the final chapter of your book. You divide your book in chapters suggesting phases of national dominance. But nowadays, big leagues seem to be moving further away from national identities. Coaches and players are switching between the leagues, foreign players basically dominating the lineups all the big, of all the big sides. Um, and where that is really obvious is the last chapter of the book in, in, in England. Uh, it's a big melting pot of cultures. Uh, all the best coaches from everywhere are going there. Um, do you think is that a precursor for football everywhere or is that an outlier and specific to the Premier League? That there is no real national identity uh, anymore? Yeah. Um, I think there's probably less of a huge divide between nations in terms of their footballing style. But I think the Premier League is a little bit unique because we basically don't produce any coaches ourselves, not at the top level. And so we're just completely dependent on, you know, there's a little bit of an English style that some of the managers adapt to, but I think we're completely dependent on managers coming across and, and bringing things that they've popularized elsewhere. So maybe England is, is a little bit of an outlier in that respect, but um, it's probably true that there's, going to be less of an obvious Italian style and Spanish style. There'll still be regional variations, but I think because football's so globalized and there's so many players coming and going from abroad and so many regular Champions League meetings for the top sides, you do stay, you know, you do just have teams and players learning from one another. So, yeah, a bit of both. I, I think the Premier League is a little bit of an outlier because of the, the basically its individual lack of identity. So the Premier League is not the end of history. Uh, and we will be able to point out phases of national dominance in 20 years' time as well. Yeah, no, I do hope so. I do hope that, you know, I can update the book in 10 years' time or whatever and there's still kind of different uh, different chapters and different styles to go on. Um, because for me, that's, you know, it's kind of why I wrote the book. It's, it's the most interesting thing about football, the fact that there's so many different styles across the major leagues. and Just seeing big differences of styles is always, for me, one of the most interesting things about watching a football game. Um, as you say, England has been blending the various styles in the Premier League in recent years. 
do you see that as a sign of power in that the Premier League can afford to acquire all these players and all these managers? Or maybe as a sign of weakness in that their own direct physical approach really didn't get them anywhere for decades now? Yeah, I think... Um... Yeah, a bit of both. I think, to be honest, I think for all the money that is in the Premier League, we've kind of underachieved in terms of European success over the last five years. Obviously, the season just gone. We did very well with both Champions League semi uh, finalists and both Europa League finalists. But before that, there'd been a real underachievement um, for various reasons. I think probably more to do with individual clubs' weaknesses rather than a big collective problem. But yeah, you're right. I mean, football's completely moved away from the old fashioned. English physical long ball style. You don't really have any teams playing like that. Certainly not at the top level. Um, you know, even the likes of Stoke and West Brom and Cardiff have gone down with that. You know, that approach in the last few seasons. So next year might be a year where we don't really have any classic old school English styles. Um, although we do have a couple of reasonably promising young English coaches working at some of the lower. Premier League team so I hope there might be a little bit of a regeneration of English coaching next season um, you know in a in a in a style that isn't typical of old school English football I was just about to ask you that do you think that Eddie Howe is going to get a big club anytime soon it's tough to say I do like Eddie Howe I think there was a decent possibility that had Pochettino left Spurs then Spurs might have come in for him I can't really see any of the big Six going in for him aside from Spurs or maybe Arsenal. Um, personally, I think he maybe needs to kind of prove himself somewhere in between, whether it's Everton or you know a Leicester, a kind of team at that level, before he makes the the jump to. I mean, even aside like Spurs, you know they've just got to the Champions League final. Do they really want to take on a chance on a manager who has done really really well to get Bournemouth up to the Premier League and establish them as a mid table club? But I think it's a different situation in terms of coaching a top club I'd like to see him get that chance but I don't blame the clubs if they now feel they're in a, a status where they can look abroad and get a manager in who's kind of proven himself at that level um, but there's some other interesting managers maybe you guys won't have be so aware of but Graham Potter at Brighton and Chris Wilder at, uh, at Sheffield United are also really interesting coaches um, who are doing slightly different things so We'll have to kind of keep an eye out for them. I hope they succeed in the Premier League uh, next season because it's been a while since we've had a kind of generation of really promising young coaches. And then there's Frank Lampard go coming to Chelsea. <laughs> yeah, I can't really work that one out, to be honest. But <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed that, uh, that we have another kind of successful English coach. But I think that maybe that might be a little bit too soon for him to get a top job. Yeah, that's something I thought about. Uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer as well. Uh, so, mm. from a from the viewpoint of a Liverpool fan, I'm quite happy with those two appointments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, also I wish them well. <laughs> um, mm. the, the the final question I have about the English era is: you more or less date this to from 2016, I think, to 2020. That's next year. <laughs> um, do you think that era has already come to its full flotation or is it a bit of a hopeful prediction for next year's European Championship as well <laughs> uh, it's tough to say I mean I think the national side is is on the rise compared to where it was five or ten years ago um, I mean we're hosting the semi-finals and the final next year so if we can get to that stage again we've obviously got home advantage and maybe can try and try and win it um, I think with the national team, there's still a couple of big weaknesses. I think we lack a really good passing central midfielder. I've got slight reservations about the goalkeeper as well, Pickford. I don't think he's quite as good as we saw at the World Cup. Um, and I, I've got a kind of bad feeling that the World Cup was our, you know, a real chance for us to to do something because, you know, I don't think that Croatia team was very good in the semi final. I think. I think we were really tactically naive with not making a couple of tactical substitutions that probably should have got us to the final. And we, of course, would have been underdogs in the final, but you never know what can happen in a final. So, yeah, I hope we can win something at the national team level, of course. Um, 
I'm still slightly skeptical, but I think we're in a much better shape than we were, for example, even in 2010 or 2006 when we had superstar players, but we really had no idea how to play. I mean, really, in hindsight, not a clue. So I think we've made, made progress and we've got a good young generation of players coming through. So certainly the mood in England is, you know, people always think that English football fans are really arrogant about our prospects, but I'm not sure that's really been the case in the last few World Cups. I think I think we there was a big kind of sense of disillusionment towards the team. And I think now not only have we got a good generation of players, but we've also got quite a good atmosphere in terms of the relationship between fans and players. And I think that in itself allows the players to play in a more positive way and maybe play without the fear of failure, which I think has probably held us back, um, you know, in the last 20 years or so. And Southgate maybe was a little bit of a lucky accident for England as well. Yeah, I mean, that that came completely out of the blue and I I had no expectation that he would be so popular. I mean, I think in some ways he's... He's got a little bit lucky in some ways with with the draw for that tournament for the last World Cup. Mm. Um, but you know, in terms of in terms of bringing through players, he's been excellent. You know, he's taken a chance on players, and he's really, I'd say, forced the issue with players like um, Hudson Odoi at Chelsea, who you know Chelsea weren't really giving him a chance, and Southgate put him in the full national team and basically said, "Look, he is good enough. You've got to take a chance in this player." Or he will go abroad and play his football elsewhere. And that, you know, that's a completely new approach to international selection. And in a way, it's a shame that it's come to that, that he's had to be so bold and, and take a chance on these players when you could argue a couple of them weren't ready. But I think it's kind of paid off. And, and hopefully those players will get more chances at their clubs um, in the next year or so. Also, England won the Under-20 World Cup two years ago. So it's not like uh, those boys don't know how to play. Mm. Um, Two general questions um, at the end of our podcast, of our interview. First, um, the resistance from the old guard is one of the themes that occur virtually in every chapter. It was the resistance against the new ideas of Saki in Italy and, and the gloating almost when, when Cesare Maldini was, was appointed instead of him. The resistance against di ditching the sweeper and the trademark functional approach in Germany. Resistance against the less physical approach in England. Uh, do you have the feeling that there ever was something productive coming out of those discussions, or were they generally just talk of people who saw themselves and their ideas phased out of football? Yeah, I think it's it's generally the latter. It's generally people just saw their ideas are getting phased out. But at the same time, you know, to refer back to an earlier question you said about the, you know, our national identity is going to persist. In the upcoming years, you know, I really like the difference in styles, and I do. I kind of have some um, enjoyment out of the fact that Italians would were proud of Italian traditional football. You know, the tradition of Italian football. They didn't want their football to just be purely Dutch. Of course, you've got to ad adapt and you've got to adjust, um, and you've got to keep up with with what the modern trends are in football if you want to win things. But, you know, I think you can always do that with a, a reference to how your, your players and how your fans want to see football. So, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that as a, you know, as a common theme, the resistance. I hadn't really considered that in this book. It was certainly a, a, you know, a main part of my first book about English football, which is very conservative. Um, but, yeah, I think gradually you see that it's generally the modernizers who, who win the day and, and move things forward. And I think that's something we should be thankful for. And because that's something, uh, whining of former players is something very commonplace in Austria also. <laughs> Although there were no good old days. <laughs> Not in our Just lifetimes. Just that one game in 1978. Yeah, and, and, and something long, long before our lifetimes. Um, your book is a history on the modern European game in general. Um, and the era you cover saw Europe's clubs clubs dominating on the on the international level as well uh, in in on, and, and the national teams. Um, the clubs dominating the international intercontinental cup and the club world cup and the national sides winning all of the past four world cups. Really, uh, that's very unlike the decades before that. Um, 
We were watching the Super Classico in the Copa Libertadores last year. Uh, and, you, and, and while that was the final in the best um, competition in South America, which is arguably the second best continent to play football nowadays, it, it was very hard to imagine that any of these teams would get even to the, to the Euro, uh, Europa League final or something like that. So South American influence is wavering and it's difficult to see it researching somehow. Um, although it still produces great players and coaches, of course. Do you think you've missed anything important in terms of football developments and innovation by concentrating your book on Europe? Not really, to be honest, which I think is a, is kind of sad because, you know, I like I love the fact that football is the kind of global game and I love the fact that there's so many regional variations. Um, I mean, my knowledge of those other, you know, of confederations outside Europe is not great. But at the end of the day, all the talent flows to Europe, certainly in terms of players and I guess in terms of coaches, although you see that less um but yeah like you say when i watch south american football it's not of great standard um and i guess that is you know as you as you mentioned in in terms of previous decades beforehand brazilian teams and argentine teams were often the ones to beat and now we're seeing the biggest ever period of european dominance and this comes kind of 20 years after certainly in england i don't know whether this is the case in other european countries but I remember a lot of people in England saying, well, we've got to win the World Cup in the next two or three editions because, you know, in 20 years time, by which I mean the time at the moment, America will have progressed. Australia will have progressed. Japan will be up there. Some of the African sides at that point, Nigeria and Cameroon, looked like they were shaping up to be real forces. And we haven't really seen that. You know, I mean, the USA failed to qualify for the, for the World Cup that 20 years ago we were saying maybe they would compete at. Australia have fallen away after a golden generation. Japan haven't really pushed on. And the African sides are still kind of getting to that. You know, one gets to the quarterfinal stage. They still haven't had a semi-finalist. So, yeah, more than ever, this is a period of European dominance. And, yeah, I guess that's maybe the one of the kind of takeaways of the book is that, um, yeah, it's it's more dominant than ever. Mm. It, it, seem, it seems more like yes all of those countries that you just mentioned they are catching up but not really to Europe but more to South America so the, the maybe the, yeah. the, the struggle for the second spot <laughs> in terms of continents is maybe more open than ever but the gap between the first and the second even more so yeah I think you're right and it'd be good if a couple of those countries push on I always you know the last few tournaments I've kind of expected Mexico or Japan to to push on but um hasn't quite happened ghana as well in in 2010 so yeah hopefully in the future we can see a little bit more diversity because i think that's good for for world cups as a whole the japan team under zaccaroni from from 2011 was one of the probably the greatest asian national team that there has ever been but they just peaked too late for 2010 and too early for 2014 by which there were already fading it's a shame yes i was always rooting for chile and mexico in the last two world cups as well mm. <laughs> playing attra attractive football but not really getting through okay final question final question how many matches did you have to watch or did you re-watch for the book <laughs> ah I, to be honest i'm not sure i can completely put a figure on it um well, let's say, let's let, let's ask this. What was the oldest match? Oldest match? Uh, the oldest match must have been the UEFA Cup final, or certainly the European finals in in 1992. One of which was won by Ajax, and one of which was won by Barcelona. So, yeah, there was nothing pre 1992, which is when the book starts. So, it kind of went in phases. There was a lot of Dutch stuff in the 90s. Syria was by far the most difficult to research because there were so many teams and so much to cover. But there was a lot of 90s stuff. And then, as you say, with France and Portugal, it was more about the national team or certain select performances from club teams. And then from 2010 onwards, there wasn't so much watching to do because I'd kind of covered the game for the Zonal Marking website. So, yeah, it was, it was maybe not as many as you would think because there was a lot of highlights and a lot of that kind of thing that was, was going on as well. But... Uh, yeah, the matches that I did rewatch were pretty much all the 1990s. Okay, uh, Philip, do you have any questions left? Um, no, no, not really. Only to really again thank you for 
coming on the show. Yes, thank you a lot. No, my pleasure. It's, it's very nice to to speak to you, Philip, and also to you, Tom. And uh, I've never I've never been to Austria. I've never been to a game in Austria. I've never been there at all. So oh, you should change that. It, yeah, if there honestly, if there's any, if there's anything even vaguely tactically interesting about <laughs> okay, that's, any Austrian teams, <laughs> well, uh, you can always watch uh, Salzburg. No, the yeah, Bull. yeah, yeah. They they <laughs> always seem to be quite exciting and interesting things going on. But I, I mean it seriously. I'd I'd love to uh, I'd love to come o- have an excuse to come over sometime to watch some football because you know I try to tick off as many countries as possible. So <laughs> please let me know if there's anything worthwhile. Of course, and you can crash on our couch then. Das war unser Podcast für heute und den nächsten haben wir auch schon in der Pipeline. Der wird dann ungefähr in einer Woche erscheinen. Wenn ihr den nicht verpassen wollt, dann geht jetzt in eure liebste Podcast-App auf Apple Podcasts, auf Stitcher, auf Overcast, auf Castbox, wo auch immer ihr Podcast hört, auch auf Spotify und YouTube und abonniert den Ballverliebt EU Fußball Podcast. Wir freuen uns natürlich immer von euch zu hören. Ihr könnt uns Feedback über Facebook, über Twitter, über ballverliebt.eu im Blog natürlich hinterlassen. Wir freuen uns immer über Diskussionen, über unsere Inhalte. Und wenn es euch gefallen hat, dann erzählt natürlich auch euren Freunden von diesem Podcast. Es hilft uns wirklich sehr, um neue Leute zu erreichen und zu wachsen. Und noch einmal die Erinnerung, wir leben rein von unserer Fanfinanzierung. Wenn ihr uns unterstützen möchtet, dann geht jetzt auf patreon.com slash ballverliebt und haut uns ein Bier im Monat ins Körper. Danke und bis zum nächsten Mal. Ciao.